Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to crypto. So I'm going to talk uh, about a simpler variant of UC security for the case of standard multiparty computation, joint work with uh, Rankinetti and a soft coin. Uh, probably all of you know, in the setting of secure computation, we have a set of parties with private inputs who wish to compute some joint function of their inputs uh, while preserving certain security properties like privacy, correctness, independence of inputs, and more. And these have to be uh, guaranteed even if some of the parties are corrupted and attack the protocol in some way. And the reason why this topic is, uh, has uh, had so much study over the last 25 years or so and is so central to cryptography is because it can model any cryptographic task, or I'll say almost any cryptographic task. So if you prove feasibility or infeasibility, or we construct general protocols, and they have very, very broad applicability. And that's really what's made secure, secure computation so central to the theory and, and recently the, the practice of, of uh, cryptography. We want to actually define security. We don't define it by looking at privacy, correctness, and a list of different properties. But we try and think about what's the best we could actually hope for. And the best that we could hope for is this, if, there, if there was just one person we could all trust. If there's just one person we'd all, we could all trust, an incorruptible trusted party, and we had magic ideal channels between each party and that trusted party, then everyone could just send their inputs to the trusted party, could compute the function, and return the output. And this would give us all of the properties and everything that we wanted. Uh, the problem is this is an ideal world, so we don't really have such a trusted party, but this is essentially what we want to emulate. And note that in this uh, ideal world, adversary really can't do anything but just choose its input. So really, there's nothing you can do to attack the protocol, and everything is, is as we would want. In order to define security, what we do is we compare between an execution of a real protocol and this ideal world. And we say that, very informally, of course, that a real world protocol is secure if it behaves essentially like this ideal execution. Or stated differently, secure computation protocols emulate an incorruptible trusted party in a world without any trust. And so we can look at these secure protocols really as ideal boxes that are computed by trusted parties. And then we can uh, consider the world in that way. And that makes, uh, uh, makes things very clear and, and, uh, uh, and uh, understandable. In particular, we know exactly what security guarantees we're getting because these ideal functionalities are supposed to be very simple and very easy to understand. Uh, we'll see a bit later on that that's not always the case, but at least that's what's supposed to be. And when, there, and when we have a very, very clear and simple ideal functionality, we know exactly what we're gaining and what the security guarantees are. A very, very important property of security uh, is that of sequential composition or modular sequential composition. And this goes back to uh, uh, the early, earlier work, and in particular 2000 and even earlier, we uh, consider a hybrid model. In this hybrid model, the parties communicate with each other as usual sending messages. But they're also allowed to speak to an incorruptible trusted party who will compute some sub-functionalities for them. So I may be constructing some large protocol. And I may need to use commitments, zero knowledge, oblivious transfer, other primitives. And I use a trusted party to help me compute those. And then I build my protocol inside this uh, hybrid model, where I have both a trusted party and both regular communication. And then I prove security of my uh, larger protocol or application with these uh, ideal calls inside to this trusted party. Actually, it facilitates a much easier uh, analysis of the security of the, of, the, of the protocol. And I derive, of course, in the end, a real protocol by replacing those ideal calls with actual secure protocols that compute those sub-functionalities. So I'll put some uh, secure oblivious transfer, some zero-knowledge protocol, et cetera, et cetera. And the composition guarantee is that the real protocol will behave like the hybrid one. So, and that's something which is given to me automatically. As soon as these sub-protocols sub are proven secure, they behave like ideal calls. And now we can analyze the protocol in this, in this uh, uh, much simpler way. And there are two really big advantages here. One is a simplified protocol design and analysis, which is very important. It's very hard to prove security properly. So being able to simplify, simplify that is very important. But also, it's a very basic security guarantee. We want to make sure that we can run the protocol many times, because if you can only run the protocol once, and if as soon as you run it twice, the security may break, it's not going to be very useful. So this guarantees security even when I run many, many times. The problem is that it also has a huge limitation. This security is only preserved uh, when the protocols are run sequentially. But in the real world, protocols are run concurrently. Many protocols are run at the same time. Different protocols designed by different people in different places around the world and the standard definition of security does not cover that case. 
And that's really where universal composability came, comes in. And this uh, 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 new definition, not new anymore, but in 2001 it was new, uh, uh, says that the, if you prove security according to this definition, then security is guaranteed even when arbitrary protocols are run concurrently uh, with your secure protocol. And so this idea that a secure protocol behaves like an ideal box, like a call to a trusted party, holds even in a very uh, adversarial world with arbitrary secure and insecure protocols running together with your secure protocol. And the primary definitional difference between universal composability and the standard standalone definitions is, is the addition of an interactive environment uh, entity. And this in environment is essentially like an interactive distinguisher. It chooses the inputs for the honest parties and writes to their input tape. It reads their outputs, but also interacts online with the adversary. And the environment actually uh, essentially captures the, the rest of what's happening in the world. So all of these other possible protocols that are running alongside your secure protocol are essentially captured by this environment. And uh, of course, that's just the intuition. The, there's a, the formal proof of security of composition tells you that if you, can prove, if you prove security of your protocol with this environment involved, then you're fine to run your protocol in any sort of setting. So that's really what the most fundamental uh, contribution of universal composability is, it's the addition of this environment to the world. The problem is that things start to get complicated. And one of the reasons they start to get complicated is because over the years, uh, we've considered many, many types of, uh, or many different models for secret implementation. We can talk about many different types of adversaries. Is adversary semi-honest or malicious? Does it, uh, are the corrupted fixed ahead of time? So is it static corruptions, or are they adaptively chosen throughout the computation? Maybe they're even proactive, so they can be corrupted for part of the uh, uh, execution, and afterwards the, the, the corruption goes away. Do we want fairness or not in our definition of security or guaranteed output delivery? Do we have other things in the world like common reference strings and random oracles? Is our network synchronous or asynchronous? Do we have authenticated or unauthenticated channels? Maybe do the parties have clocks they can use? Are we modeling only interactive protocols where parties interact with each other, or maybe also local computation, like in encryption and signatures and pseudorandom functions? And we start to look at this very, very complex world with many, many different uh, options. And the big problem is that we have this fantastic composition theorem, which tells us that if you prove your protocol secure, then everything will be fine. Uh, but that holds for whatever model is considered in the definition. So if I have a definition which holds for a specific model, then I'm in trouble uh, when I want to go to a different model, I no longer have a composition theorem. So one of the uh, things that the universal composability framework does is it captures all of these models in one and much more. Uh, it's a very, very general framework, and you can essentially capture, well, I don't, don't know if we, you can capture almost any model that you can think of. And, there, and we, so with this composition theorem is already proven for all the possible models that we can possibly want to study, which is... Fantastic. We don't need a different proof of composition for every model because as long as you can fit into the UC framework, you're already covered. Also, something additional is that what happens if I'm running a protocol in a synchronous network together with a protocol in an asynchronous network? Is it okay for them to run together? If I have different composition theorems, I'm not sure, but once it's all together in a single composition theorem, then we can run protocols that are designed and actually even executed in different models, we can run them together and security will still be guaranteed. And that's given to us by the generality of the UC framework. We can also use modular analysis even for local computation like encryption signatures and pseudorandom function. We don't have to do direct reductions to those primitives, but we can actually uh, also look at them as ideal boxes, again, facilitating a, a simpler uh, uh, proof of security. So that's the great generality, but with generality comes complexity. It doesn't come for free, and it comes at quite a price. In order to model something like a pseudorandom function or encryption, we get into trouble that things that we normally take for granted as being simple are not actually no longer simple at all, and one is just polynomial time. So a machine is polynomial time. If there's a single polynomial that bounds, upper bounds, it's running time. But if you look at the definition of a pseudorandom function, for example, the adversary gets to query the uh, oracle to ask for as many, for, to ask for the, uh, um, value of the pseudorandom function on any number of points that it chooses. When you put this inside the UC framework, it's actually the honest parties who are computing the pseudorandom function for the adversary. But the order of quantifiers is that first you fix the honest parties, they're in the protocol, and then you uh, quantify over every adversary, and that means there is now no longer any polynomial upper bound 
on any of the honest parties because they, their running time depends on the adversary. So it's not polynomial time anymore. So you have to actually change the notion of polynomial time. Uh, also, if I'm doing a local computation like encryption, it's clear that the adversary cannot schedule the delivery of a, of a message between me and the ideal functionality because there is no external ideal functionality in reality. In reality, I'm just doing a local computation. In fact, the adversary can't even see that I'm doing that computation. So if we think about communication between me and the ideal functionality something external, as we would in, a classic, uh, in the classic standalone definition and also in the classic way we think of interactive computation, you could no longer capture things like signatures and encryption. Uh, there's also this notion of, of generating or dynamically generating parties. And then you have other funny things that can happen, like let's consider every party running in linear time. And all that it does is generate another party that runs in linear time, because you have to be able to dynamically, in the UC framework, you can dynamically generate parties. So now we can have an infinite execution where every party just generates another party and, and stops. So each party is linear time, but the overall execution is infinite, and this obviously is not what we want. So just simple things like polynomial time uh, become really, really complicated. Uh, you also want to mo model partial corruptions, and I mentioned this, sometimes you do communicate externally with ideal functionality, sometimes you don't, and this is actually what you get. Now, I just want a knife and a fork, but this is what I have. So I'm lying to you when I say I want a knife and a fork because doing secure computation, even in a standalone world, is not simple. Uh, it's much more than this. It has a plier and a screwdriver and a magnifying glass, but this is almost impossible to use. And essentially, what's happened to the, to the UC framework in order to capture that generality, enable you to get all of the benefits that I talked about, you ended up getting this. And I'm not criticizing the UC framework for it. This is the byproduct of getting all that generality, and we saw the generality has its benefits. But, but now let's talk about usability. As users of the UC framework, we're sort of in trouble. It's really uh, overwhelming, and, and you know, we're used to it. I'm used to it, and uh, I've been working in this for many years, and, and, and I find it overwhelming. And someone new to the field wants to use universal composability, looks at it and says, you know what, maybe I'll stay with just the standalone world. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, more, uh, it's, it's easier to work with, and that's actually not what we want. We want people to be able to come along and prove security comfortably in, in, uh, uh, in this world with, with concurrent uh, scheduling and, and, and the more adversarial, realistic world that there is. So there's been a lot of work over the last 15 years refining the universal composability framework, uh, different notions of polynomial time and how to, formula how to formalize different, uh, different things in, in order to improve them. Uh, but in this work, we take a completely different approach. We don't want to uh, come up with a different definition of polynomial time. We want to say, you know what, I want to, I want to uh, work on the standard sort of interactive protocol setting. I don't want to model pseudorandom functions and encryption. I don't want to model all these different types of strange uh, uh, settings that are not the standard ones. I just want to do a standard, I don't know, secure AES computation or secure uh, 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 online poker. I, I don't want this uh, very complex setting. Can I, can I get a simpler definition by looking at a more restricted uh, uh, um, restricted goal. And actually, the vast majority of papers on that, that use universal composability or in general in computation, especially when we talk about papers looking at efficient constructions of protocols, have actually a very, very uh, uh, use, almost all use this specific setting. They have authenticated asynchronous channels, asynchronous because the adversary is in charge of the scheduling. There's a fixed number of participating parties. The number of parties in the protocol doesn't depend on the security parameter or depend on the input. We know that we're playing poker with five people, so we're playing poker with five people. We know we're doing a secure AES between two parties, we're doing a secure AES between two parties, and that's it. And we don't look at fairness. And this is the, the, the model that we all used to. We don't need the full generality of UC. We need a much, much, we need a very, very uh, a restricted setting of it. And that's what this, this uh, simpler variant of UC is giving you. It models only uh, a subset of what you what, of the of the possible settings. So it's only multi-party computation with a fixed number of parties, with authenticated channels, and there's no fairness. And the main design principle behind the definition was to come up with something which would be as close to the standalone definitions as possible. So if you study the standalone definitions in advanced crypto course, the extra step to universal composability is there. It's not trivial. There is this additional online adversarial environment, but that's almost all you have to uh, uh, learn in, in, in addition. So the main properties are it's a fixed communication pattern. 
There aren't, the way the parties communicate with each other is, is the same in both, in all of the models, the real hybrid and ideal models. Everything goes through a router, uh, and the ad adversary schedules the delivery of messages from that router. That's whether you're talking between honest parties, between uh, the functionality, it all goes uh, by the same communication pattern. There's a very simple notion of polynomial time. Parties are simply polynomial in the security parameter, plus the length of all the inputs that they get from the environment. That's it. Standard pol notion of polynomial time. And the order of activations of who goes when is very, very simple. It's adversary, party, adversary, party, adversary, party. There's no uh, uh, complicated, uh, uh, no, no additional possibilities of parties uh, activating each other back to the environment, back to the adversary. It's a very, very fixed set of steps, so it's easy to follow and easy to remember and easy to analyze. The case analysis that happens in a proof of security is much, much simpler because everything happens in a very, very fixed and specific way, much closer to what happens in the standalone setting. So one thing you may be thinking is, okay, nice, you gave us now another definition. We had UC, there's JUICY, there's GUC, there's GNUC, there's, there's, and now you're giving us, and, and there's, there's also a whole lot of other types of definitions. You're giving us another definition. That's exactly what's going on here, right? There's a, there are 14 definitions. We need a new one now to combine them all. Now we have 15 definitions. So no, that's actually exactly what we're not doing. And if this is the most important thing I'm going to say now in the entire talk, is we do not want a new definition. There are actually simpler versions of UC which are floating out there. Uh, we are not, this, that's not what we're doing. We're not trying to come up with another definition which is different to the UC. Rather, what we've proven, and this is the most important part of the paper, what we've proven is if you work in this simpler variant of UC and you prove security there, then you get full UC security for free. So actually, we're looking at a subset, at a restricted case of standard multi-party computation tasks. And if you prove security according to SUC, then your protocol is automatically secure also in the full UC model. And this is nice, because now you can work in this simpler variant and get full UC interoperability. So if you're running together now with uh, protocols that are in these other more complex models that we're not considering, security is still guaranteed, because we have this equivalence for these protocols. I just want to mention there's, there is some transformation in the functionality that you have to make because of uh, the generality of the UC, but, but the protocol is still secure in, in, in the sense that you would expect it to be, exactly as you would expect. And you only worked in this much, much simpler variant. You automatically got the full UC security. The good thing is you can also write a paper and say UC secure. You don't have to say in your title this is SUC secure. In fact, the fact that you're using SUC can appear just in the first line of your proof of security. Right? You write your introduction, you write your protocol, your motivation, you write your theorem, you get to the proof, you say, we prove this secure in the SUC framework, and we derive full UC security via the, comp the theorem that, that exists in that paper. That's it. So now you can work simply, uh, without all of the hassles, without all the complexities, but you're still getting the, uh, the full guarantees that you want, and you're not working in some other definition, which is good because UC has become the gold standard. Right, you typically, if we want to look at proof of security under the concurrent world, we want UC security. So you can use this definition. You still have UC security. It's not SUC security. It's UC security. And that's really the most important contribution to this paper. Simple, but the same. So I want to just, uh, with the time that I have left, I want to just demonstrate uh, why it's simpler to work in the, uh, um, in the SUC framework. And this is actually the most important reason really has to do with polynomial time. Uh, and the way it's modeled in the UC framework. But that's, in order to explain that, I have to go into many, many details about how the UC framework is defined. And uh, uh, I'd rather not do that. I assume that many of you would rather I don't do that either. So I mentioned earlier on that one of the advantages of um, this ideal real model paradigm is that ideal functionalities are simple. We can look at them and know exactly what we're getting. So this is the way we define uh, a secure commitment in, in an ideal world. Uh, the, there's an ideal functionality fcom. The party committing party sends a commitment message to the ideal functionality. The ideal functionality records that message and sends a receipt to the receiver. The receipt just says, here's an identifier, and you should know that this value has been recorded, but I don't tell you anything about the value. And then when the committer sends an open message with an identifier, the trusted party re retrieves the original value from storage and sends it on. So this Binding is clear because the value was stored by the ideal functionality. 
And hiding is, is information theoretic in this ideal world because the receiver learned nothing but this receipt until the opening happened. So this is very, very simple. It's very easy to analyze protocols, the security protocols given in, in, this, in a hybrid model with this commitment functionality and everything is very, very nice and we're all happy. But if you look at full UC commitments, then you suddenly see all these other complexities that, that, are, uh, uh, that, that, are, that are more difficult. So, Firstly, when you send this commitment message, it's not sent to the functionality. Rather, um, uh, well, actually, it is sent to the functionality, but the functionality doesn't process it. It generates something called a public delayed output. A public delayed output is a way of saying that it gives this message to the adversary to decide when it will be delivered. So in, in the simple UC variant, you, you're interacting externally, so you send the message to a router, and, and the adversary decides when to deliver it. So this is built in, and that's actually the way things always happen in, 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 an, in, in a world where the adversary schedules messages. But because the UC framework has to, has to model local computation, it's not automatic that the adversary can schedule, so you have to explicitly tell the commitment functionality to, to allow scheduling. And likewise, with the uh, opening, but when you get to the third line, it becomes even uh, stranger, because now, for some reason, the functionality is processing commitment, uh, cor corruption messages. But what, it, what does corruption have to do with the functionality? Well, again, this has to do with the generality of the UC framework, and it's already very far from what we're used to in the standalone model. And uh, the previous one, the previous commitment is really what we'd expect and what we'd like, and essentially that's what you're getting, uh, because again, it's, it's equivalent when, when uh, we look at the full UC framework, but you, cannot, you need to only work with this simpler, more concise definition. So simple UC versus UC, polynomial time is simple in UC. In, 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 it's simple in simple UC. It's very complex in the full framework. Uh, there are funny things happening, like you have to pad the input length and the functionality definition can actually depend on how you implement the protocol because of the way polynomial time is, is defined, which makes things very complex. Uh, corruption is simple in, in, in SUC. It's exactly like in the standalone model. The order of activation is, is fixed. It's, it's really... Uh, uh, sort of the way that people work anyway, and I'll talk about that a little bit in, in, in the last slide. It helps a lot both with defining protocols but also with the, full, the, the proof proving security because things are, are as we would expect. So in summary, we introduced a far simpler version of, of universal composability. We call it SUC or, or simpler UC. Uh, it adds an environment like it has to and it formalizes a multi-execution polynomial time but in a natural way has a simple series of activations communication pattern, and it's less difficult to work with, both for seasoned researchers who've been doing UC computation for 15 years, and also for people who want to get into the field and want to prove security and concurrency, but are overwhelmed by all the possibilities given to them. M very importantly, we prove equivalence. We prove that for the subset of protocols that are, can be modeled in the SUC framework, it's fully equivalent to the full UC, and so uh, this gives the property that, properties that I mentioned beforehand. Now, if you look around at papers written in uh, the proof security in UC, almost no one, or no one, actually, we didn't succeed in finding any paper which gives a complete full proof of UC security because it's just too complicated. So you, our work, in some sense, justifies this, but not justifies this by saying it's okay to hand wave, but justifies it in saying that, yes, you can work in a simpler model, as in the way that you think uh, in the conceptual way, but you can also do it rigorously. Now, you don't have to do that and be hand waving what you, your proof can now be a full, rigorous proof of security, and you can get it in a simpler model by just saying that refer to the proof, of, the, the proof of equivalence in the SUC paper, and you can continue working the way that you want to work and, uh, and come back and, and, and work uh, in, in the UC world. Thank you very much.